Welcome to the Cheating Secrets channel. We hope you enjoy today's story. I assume there are not many ways to learn about a cheating wife. I danced with Marcy Blaine at Harvest Moon Dance at the club where my wife and I are members. That's Southside Golf Country Club, one of the most fashionable clubs in Chicago. Such unusual things make Lucinda happy, and I have the money to make her happy. At least, I hoped she would be happy. In any case, Marcy is one of Lucinda's closest friends. She and her husband Charlie shared a table with us, and he was not a good dancer, so I played the role of a nice guy, giving Marcy a chance to hit the dance floor. We glided across the floor, both of us cheerful, just relaxing, and I said, you and Lucinda have definitely been spending a lot of time at the gym recently. Are you both preparing for a marathon, or just trying to get even better than you already are? I was just making small talk, giving a compliment. Marcy and Lucinda are indeed both magnificent-looking women in their 30s, compared to my 40-something years, with long legs and stunning figures. But Marcy surprised me. She didn't react and, without thinking, said, God, Dave, I haven't been to the gym in weeks. I don't know why you. Then, belatedly, she must have realized she said something wrong. I think she and Lucinda concocted a story, and Marcy just forgot about it. I saw her looking at me in horror, so I pretended not to notice. I said, huh? Oh, sorry, Marcy. I thought you noticed Jack Yelenik at the end of the room. I haven't seen him at one of these dances in years. So, what were you saying? I deliberately gave Marcy a second chance, and she took it, watching me closely. Oh, I just said that Lucinda really works hard with me. She's the only one who is determined to always stay young. I would rather relax in a sauna. She laughed, and I smiled along with her. I could see she was almost convinced she had gotten away with it, and that's exactly what I wanted her to think. Inside, of course, I felt a nauseating sensation in my stomach. If Lucinda wasn't spending several hours in the gym two or three times a week, then where had she been? I never liked the term, trophy wife, but I had to admit that Lucinda fit the criteria. My first marriage, right after college, ended within a few years, and I spent the rest of my 20s and 30s in solitude, working my face off. I dated some, but mainly, I devoted myself to studying business finance and founded my own firm. We hit the $100 million mark when I was 38, and by the time I turned 40, I was personally worth about $12 million. Lucinda and I met at a party and hit it off immediately. Not surprisingly, at least from my side, since she is very beautiful, full of life, cheerful, confident, and intelligent. It was much less obvious why she was interested in me, although someone might have told her about my money, but it seemed she liked me right from the start. We dated for about six months before I proposed to her, and although I made it clear that marrying me would involve a solid prenuptial agreement, she was happy to say, yes. At her insistence, we had a big, fancy Chicago wedding, followed by a three-week honeymoon in Bali, where she mostly tried to kill me by having sex. Did I mention that Lucinda loves sex? Either that or she loves pleasing me and knows I enjoy it. In any case, all the frolicking we did, before and after the wedding, made me a very happy man. However, Marcy's slip of the tongue made me wonder if I was becoming a cliché, the husband of a trophy wife. It took no more than two weeks to uncover the dirty details. Lucinda had been sleeping with Chris Remington, the hour director of Chicago Serve, a charity where she volunteered. Lucinda didn't want to work full-time after we got married, which suited me fine. Apparently, they spent several months sweating it out in the bedrooms of various fashionable hotels. God knows how they paid for the rooms, because Lucinda made sure there were no unexpected charges on her Platinum Amex card. However, all this fun didn't prevent Lucinda from keeping me warm. Our own sexual life was as vigorous as before. I didn't know if she still cared about me, or if jumping into bed with me after being with her lover excited her somehow. But it didn't matter. Now that I knew I was sharing her, our marriage had to end. But you don't succeed in business by being hot-headed and acting on emotions, and I had been quite successful. I decided to spend at least two more weeks thinking about my options before making a move against my deceitful wife. She was going to leave, that was decided. But first, I needed to know more. And, more, was related to a conversation on one of the audio tapes that my detective agency told me about. They had all the audio and photos I would ever need, but I hadn't looked at or listened to any of it. She was unfaithful, our marriage was over, and that was that. No need to torture myself. However, her intimate conversations went beyond the usual, turning into, I can't wait until we can be together all the time, 
and when you gather all the money together and leave your husband. That caught my attention. So, I conducted a discreet investigation and check up. It turned out that in the last four months, my loving fiancé had managed to siphon off over $230,000 of my money. She made regular ATM withdrawals, not too much at once, but far more frequently than before. And she was buying dresses, shoes, and accessories on her Amex card. I never restricted her budget, and then quietly returning them for cash. I know, I know, stores shouldn't allow this. I suppose Lucinda had a deal with them, either because she was such a good customer or because someone was getting a kickback. In any case, she got away with it. So, I caught Lucinda red-handed, but didn't know where the money was. And I knew that $230,000 wouldn't keep her happy for long, so what was the rest of her plan? I decided to sit tight a little longer until I figured everything out. It was only after three days that I received a response. A young woman from First United Bank called my office to discuss our safety deposit box. Actually, our box, because it was a joint account with Lucinda. The young woman, Judy Steinberg, was clearly a good employee, attentive and proactive. She had been working at the bank for just a few weeks, having secured the job when she returned from Sweden, where she had worked for several years, and acquired a husband. She called to inform me that my wife had caused quite a scene that day. Lucinda had tried to gain access to our box, but Judy informed her that she could not open it unless I was also present and signed in the bank's logbook. Apparently, Lucinda was overly demonstrative in her reaction, and Judy needed the help of two security guards to make her leave. It only took a few seconds before I realized that I now knew the rest of Lucinda's plans. Among various legal documents of no financial value in our bank box were jewels worth about $2 million that I had bought for my beloved wife, an impressive diamond necklace, several pairs of diamond earrings, and a sapphire and diamond bracelet. I had always thought that, regardless of my other allurements, it was these expensive purchases that convinced Lucinda of my potential as a husband. And now it seemed she was considering these trinkets as a stash for her escape with Chris, her young lover. A few more days of audio surveillance provided the rest of what I needed. Lucinda had already given the money to Chris, it seems she really trusted her lover. They bought plane tickets for two separate and carefully planned trips to Rio de Janeiro. All that was left for Chris was to impersonate me at the bank and help Lucinda extract the jewels from the safe. After that, they would be on their way. Whoever said, knowledge is power, was absolutely right. The rest was child's play. On Thursday morning, November 19th, Lucinda wanted to wake me up early. She also had a good way of doing that, using her mouth on my body, followed by a vigorous bounce in the cowgirl position until we both were aroused. Then she dragged me into the shower, where we played around a bit while washing. That was a great start to the day, dear, I said. Is there a special occasion today? She smiled in response and handed me a coffee. Not at all, Dave, I just wanted to make sure you know how I feel about you. She came over and sat on my lap, pressing against me and feeding me a piece of bacon. We hugged and kissed until the end of breakfast, and then I went to get dressed for work. As I was putting on my coat, she came down to the hall and casually said, Oh, by the way, dear. That damn board meeting has been moved to tonight, so I might be back quite late. It's a big nuisance, but I promised I would attend. Will you forgive me? I received another tight hug and a kiss along with the question, and of course, I told her everything was fine. It wasn't hard to figure out what she meant. She was making me not worry, giving herself a few extra hours before I would start to wonder where she had disappeared to. I smiled as I sat at my desk. Today was the day, and everything was in place. Lucinda's flight was scheduled to depart at 2.35, and Chris's flight, with another airline, at 3.15. My people would be at the airport by noon, and when Chris tried to board, he would be arrested for carrying more than $10,000 in cash, violating federal currency regulations. I had the evidence to show the money was mine, well, mine and Lucinda's, and there was little doubt he would be in jail for some time. But no one was going to bother Lucinda. She would check her bags, board the plane, and be on her way. About 19 hours and 4 flights later, she would land in Rio, ready to start her new life with Chris, a large amount of money, and plenty of valuable jewels. The only problem was there would be no Chris, no cash. My phone rang just after 11.30, as expected, it was Judy Steinberg. They were here, she said. Just as you predicted, your wife came with someone else, a tall guy, a bit younger than her. 
He signed using your name, and they spent a few minutes with the safe before leaving. I smiled broadly. Thank you, Judy. You've been a great help. And I really appreciate that you let me access my box smoothly the other day, as soon as I explained the situation. I leaned back in my chair, savoring the thought of Lucinda on the plane, holding her large purse on her lap with the jewels worth $2 million, unaware that all of it was fake, worth about $150. I doubted that money would be enough to give Lucinda the life she hoped for and was accustomed to. Listen, I said, I would like to express my gratitude personally. How about I invite you and Hendrick to dinner this Saturday? Somewhere really fancy, like La Rondine? Quote. Judy giggled and said, Thank you, Uncle Dave, that would be great. Quote. Thank you for being with us and listening until the end. If you found it interesting, please subscribe, give us a like, and leave your comments. And we'll see you on the Cheating Secrets channel.